Hey, what's going on you guys? It's Aces High, and uh, today I'm bringing you guys the second of six parts of Kings and Generals, uh, six-part series on the successors of Alexander. Um, so basically, this is the second part. It's uh, titled uh, Battles of... Wow, I am horrible at names. What is that? Para... Para... I don't know. Para Takine? And uh, Gabriene? Something like that. Anyway, it's gonna, a few years later. It's uh, 317 to 316 BC. Um, and it's just kind of what happened after the last video. If you guys missed that last one, go ahead and go check it out. Um, I'm really excited to see what kind of is shaping up. It seems like the generals are kind of forming their own regions and trying to fight for control at this point. Uh, and it's kind of turning into a little bit of chaos, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, anyway, I'm going to sit back, shut up, and uh, let's just get started. This video is sponsored by Lumerit. Lumerit, a better way to do college. This video is not sponsored by Lumerit. ...is over, and Alexander's empire is partitioned at Triparadisus for the second time. Yet many generals and statesmen still vie for more lands and are ready for more bloodshed to fulfill their ambitions. Hmm. It is the spring of 319 BC, and one of the main players of the First War of the Diadochi, Eumenes, is still trapped in Nora in Cappadocia. The new regent, Antipater, and the royal family had just returned from Asia to Mac Sorry to cut him off, but uh, this thing that just popped up at the uh, top, it, it reminded me that uh, if you haven't gone and seen the first part, go ahead and watch the first part. It's on uh, my channel or on the original uh, Kings and Generals channel titled... Uh, was it successors of Alexander 322 through 320 BC, I believe? Macedonia, which became the center of the empire yet again. Hmm. Yet Antipater was now 80 years old, and by the end of the spring of 319 BC, the regent breathed his last. The consequences would be far reaching. Meanwhile, Antigonus was in Pisidia. He had recently gained a stunning victory against the remaining rebels, among them Perdiccas's brother, Alcatas. He had then headed north, towards Phrygia, where the news of Antipater's death reached him. It was now his decision to decide the fate of Eumenes. With Antipater's death, Antigonus now saw a great opportunity to take control of the empire for himself. Recognizing Eumenes' proven potential to command, he made a generous offer. He would reinstate Eumenes as governor of Cappadocia, with promises of more land. Even more generously, Antigonus asked Eumenes to become his second in command. Oh, see that seems like a solid deal because Eumenes, uh, he knows he's outmanned, he knows he can't hold it forever, I'm sure he wants the power of first in command, but uh... Maybe even if he even if he wants that, he could pretend to be second command, kind of weasel his way up, maybe, um, or just stick with it. That's still pretty solid. Eumenes accepted the offer, I don't and the him. siege was lifted. For the time being, he returned to governing Cappadocia, raising an army to aid Antigonus. But Antigonus was not the only powerful Macedonian who was looking for allies at that time. Back in Macedonia, Antipater's successor, Polyperchon, was also eyeing the support of Eumenes. At that time, Polyperchon's position was in jeopardy, as Antipater's son, Cassander, was gathering an army to confront him. Cassander sailed over to Asia Minor to petition Antigonus, and the latter agreed to Cassander's offer of an alliance. Hmm. Oh, look at those great ships. Polyperchon cool couldn't take on the 70,000 strong army of Antigonus by himself. So he sent a messenger to Eumenes, and his offer was irresistible. Eumenes was offered the title of King's General in Asia, the most prestigious military position of the time. Polyperchon also... Is there also a King's General of, like, South Europe or something like that? I mean, I don't know. At the time, being... Uh from Europe 
type area, I guess, I would see a lot of people as seeing Asia as kind of inferior or something like that. I mean, maybe not, I guess, uh, perhaps they're from the Middle East type area, you know, from Asia, so I'm not 100% sure, but that's just a guess. Is that really the highest military at the time? Like, highest position? offered him access to the vast royal treasury at Kuinda, and even more auspiciously, command of the Silver Shields, Alexander's veteran Macedonian infantry guarding wow. the treasury. Eumenes quickly reached a decision. He abruptly broke his agreement with Antigonus and headed to Kuinda. There, as promised, he gained access to the royal treasury and the formidable silver shields. The war between Eumenes and Antigonus became inevitable. Antigonus was furious. I can't Thanks to Polyperchon's offer, he now had a new great threat in the east. Abruptly, his plans to invade Macedonia were put on hold, and he headed east in pursuit of Eumenes. Yet by the time he reached Syria, Eumenes had already departed and was moving further to the east, keen to enlist the aid of the eastern governors. Near Susa, Eumenes... I wonder if they'd actually follow Eumenes, considering he uh, was under Alexander and there were a lot of... Uh, weren't there a lot of revolts over here against Alexander at the time? Um, so I wonder if they'd actually want to follow him at all. He's met with many of these satraps, already united with their armies. Most notable among these men was a friend of Eumenes, the governor of Persia, Pusestus. Hmm. There was also Eudemus, who had come from India with a large force of elephants. After some initial bickering, agreement was reached. The two forces joined together, and Eumenes now found himself leading a formidable army, consisting of Persians, Macedonians, Greeks, Bactrians, and Indians. Meanwhile, Antigonus had not been idle. Having received reinforcements, he had been in hot pursuit of Eumenes. In the summer of 317 BC, their forces finally clashed on the eastern bank of the Caprates River, now known as the Dej River in Iran. While Antigonus's forces were in the midst of crossing, Eumenes led a detachment of 4,000 infantry and 1300 cavalry towards the river and see i was just thinking if they could just stop them from crossing then uh i mean they can kill them as they each try to cross you know it uh, doesn't work however if they're able to fight them back and get ground on this side then the whole army can cross that was a really good move and charged the forces of antigonus that had reached the other side some six thousand men were taken completely by surprise. Disorder ensued, and soon that part of Antigonus's army was routed. Mm. Eumenes had won a small but clear victory, taking over 4,000 of Antigonus's men prisoner. Unable to cross, Antigonus was forced to head north around the Zagros Mountains. Fresh from this victory, and with Antigonus off his back, Eumenes had now planned to turn around, heading back with his large army towards the Mediterranean. Yet his eastern allies, among them Pusestus, refused to comply. They feared that if they headed west, Antigonus would ravage their provinces in the meantime, hmm. as the eastern provinces were some of the richest in the empire. Relenting, Eumenes abandoned his plans and continued east to Persepolis. Meanwhile, Antigonus had moved around the mountains and was again advancing on Eumenes. Oh, he's trying to trap Hearing him. this, Eumenes marched his forces from okay. Persepolis to meet those of his rival. On the plains of Peritacane, their forces would clash once again. Eumenes' force numbered just over 40,000 men including 35,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and 114 elephants. The crazy part about this is, uh, back when I was watching the Napoleonic Wars, they would have armies the size of, like, 
200, 400,000 people. Ten times that. That's just incredible. I mean, don't get me wrong, 41,000 people is still a lot. But uh, it's just, it makes you think about how big the armies of later on would be. And I'm sure in the past they had big armies like that too. Just These weren't the biggest of big armies, you know? Antigonus also had 40,000. And his army consisted of 28,000 infantry, 8,500 cavalry, and 65 elephants. Eumenes deployed his army at the bottom of the plain. On his left, Eumenes placed over 3,000 of his Asian cavalry. In the center, first he placed his mercenary infantry, followed by his 5,000 mixed Asian troops trained in the Macedonian manner, and finally, in the most prestigious place of the infantry line, the silver shields. Makes sense. On his right wing, Eumenes placed his heavy cavalry, including both himself and Pucestus. Finally, Eumenes spread his elephants along the length of his line, with light infantry in between. Facing Eumenes, Antigonus's army was positioned on a slight elevation to one side of the plain. I've got a question. Obviously, these are elephants. Uh, these are some type of bowmen, maybe on horse. I'm not sure. Uh, what the hell is this? I can't tell what that symbol is. It kind of looks like a pipe. You know, <laughs> I mean, what is that? Slingers, maybe? Did they have freaking slingers at the time? Just guys with rocks and slingshots or something? Or slings? On his left wing, he deployed his light cavalry. Among them, a thousand horse archers from Parthia and 2,000 wow. expert Tarantine cavalry under the command of Python. Next to them, Antigonus placed his mercenary infantry, followed by 8,000 mixed Asian troops trained in the Macedonian manner, and finally, his 8,000 Macedonians. On his right wing, he placed his finest cavalry, the Companions, under the command of his son, Demetrius, with himself further to the right. Antigonus placed most of his elephants in front of his infantry line, facing those of Eumenes, with light infantry interspersed between them. Very Deployed similar. in such a manner, Antigonus advanced his army at an angle. He moved his stronger right wing forward, keeping his lighter left wing further back. At the given signal, Python's light cavalry on Antigonus' left advanced against those facing them, raining arrows and javelins down on the opposing elephants and cavalry. Wow. Eumenes responded by sending a portion of his light cavalry on his left flank over to his right, chasing away Python's light horsemen from the battle. As this was going on, in the center, the infantry phalanxes had collided and a desperate struggle ensued. Finally, the great experience of Eumenes' silver shields showed itself. Many of these men had fought in the campaigns of both Philip II and his son Alexander, hmm. and although many were now in their 60s, their skill was unmatched, and they crushed Antigonus's infantry with ease. Wow. Much of Antigonus's army was now in retreat. The crazy part is, I was just about to say before he mentioned it, uh, if if they if many of them fought for Philip and for Alexander, they must be older. And yeah, like he said, some are in their 60s. That's incredible, especially back then. It's like a feeble old man, you know? I mean, even if you're in shape. that's uh, It's incredible that they're able to fight like that still. Yet the one-eyed general himself refused to withdraw. Seeing an opening on Eumenes' left, he now charged with his elite cavalry into the side of this force causing great panic and disorder. Eumenes' left wing collapsed. The rest of his army, however, was still intact and came to fend off any further attacks from Antigonus' remaining forces. With no more moves on either side, the battle ended. Each side claims the victory, yet it was Eumenes who had evidently come off better. Yeah. He had lost just over 500 men in the encounter. Antigonus, on the other hand, had lost almost 4,000. Wow. If I remember right, uh, Antigonus had, I think it was 35,000 or 37,000, 
So he lost over 10% of his army. Eumenes now marched further to Gabene, while Antigonus returned to Media. Antigonus knew that the odds were now stacked against him. His army was now smaller than that of Eumenes. He therefore attempted to outwit his foe with a surprise attack. Rather than waiting to restart campaigning next summer, Antigonus marched his army in the winter of 316 BC through a harsh wilderness, hoping to surprise Eumenes. But unfortunately for Antigonus, the plan was foiled and Eumenes managed to organize his forces on a nearby plain, awaiting the next battle. And so, in the winter of 316 BC, the final great clash between these two formidable generals was Ooh. to take place. I like the shadowing, the final clash, so one of them is dying here. I feel like Eumenes isn't going to die unless like, he snuck in and got got somehow. Once again, Antigonus deployed his forces as he had at the previous battle. Python was given command of the cavalry on the left, with Demetrius and Antigonus in command of the elite right. In the centre, Antigonus placed his infantry, now numbering 22,000, with 65 elephants spread along the front of the line. <laughs> to counter this deployment, Eumenes deployed himself with his best cavalry and elephants on his left wing, opposite Antigonus and Demetrius. Next to his cavalry were the silver shields, followed by the rest of his 36,000 infantry and elephants in front. <laughs> on his right wing, Eumenes placed his weaker cavalry along with the remaining elephants, which he intended. In my opinion, Eumenes is leaving his right side too weak. He's got his most elite cavalry over here, and he's got his silver shields over here. It leads just normal soldiers over here along with his weakest cavalry. It, uh, it, it leaves it too weak on that side. ...tended not to use. Eager for victory, Eumenes launched the attack. He ordered his elephants on the left and centre to charge. Closely following behind these tanks of ancient warfare, Eumenes and his own cavalry on the left advanced. Yet as the advance was taking place, the hooves and feet of these animals caused a large dust cloud to emerge across the plain. Mm. Seeing an opportunity, Antigonus ordered some of his light cavalry to use this cloud to their advantage, sneaking past Eumenes' line and attacking the baggage train. It would prove a critical moment. Eumenes' cavalry charge was not going well. Pucestus, his second in command, panicked and with 1,500 men withdrew from the fight. Eumenes finally called off the attack and retreated to take command of his remaining horsemen on the right. Meanwhile, the silver shields had now advanced, leading Eumenes' infantry. A fearsome spectacle, these 3,000 men then charged the entire phalanx of Antigonus. The result was devastating. Antigonus' infantry was shattered. Oh the silver God. shields have once again proven their prowess. Each side now retreated to their camps. It, it doesn't seem like Antagonus is going to win unless the silver shields are gone. They really are that elite of soldiers. Knowing victory was near, Eumenes decided to finish off Antigonus the next day. In a cruel twist of fate, however, news now reached him that his baggage train had been taken much to the horror of his army, and most notably, the Silver Shields. For them, this baggage train was their home, holding both their families and possessions. Everything they held dear was now in the hands of Antigonus. Very quickly, betrayal was afoot. Thinking only for their families and themselves, these grizzled veterans seized Eumenes that same night and handed him over to Antigonus. Eumenes' greatest soldiers had become his worst nightmare. Welcome. All right, well, scratch uh, everything I just said. Uh, he found a way to take out uh, the Silver Shields. Wow. 
welcoming his betrayed opponent with great respect, Antigonus pondered on what to do with this exceptional general. Offer him a second again. In the end, with great reluctance, Antigonus gave the order for Eumenes's execution. The extraordinary military career of Alexander's former personal secretary had met its end. Wow. Antigonus was now the most powerful man in Asia, and his story will continue in the next documentary. Okay. We often see... All right. Just like the last time, that's all ad. Um, let's have a chat about that, you guys. Uh, so, what do you think? I mean, uh, honest to God, I didn't think the Eumenes was... Uh, that he was going to lose there unless there was some type of twist or like I said if they uh if uh, he t figures out a way to uh, take out his his silver shields you know his elite soldiers and that's exactly what he did and it just yeah yeah I don't know um it's just it's interesting I so now does somebody take him down or I I don't know how many more times I guess is is everything going to switch? I'm actually looking at my screen right now, and I see that the next one is called the Battle of Gaza. So it looks like the guy that, uh, I can't remember the name, but whoever was in charge down in uh, down in Egypt right now, Thopoli or Monopoly, not Monopoly, but something Poli, uh, whatever his name was, uh, it looks like he'll actually be involved in the next one. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, anyway, I hope you guys join me for the next four. Uh, till then, this is Ace Asai, and I'm out.